This is Matthew Wall from Arizona Dental Anesthesia. I'm going to explain and show how the semi-open circuit can be used in the dental office for the anesthesiologist that does not have an anesthesia machine and they desire to intubate their patients. What you see in the first image is the Jackson Reese circuit taken directly out of its package. The circuit is in its original form and can be used, but there are several things missing like the capnography and the length of the circuit is very short, which adds a dimension of difficulty when the anesthesiologist wants to give a breath to the patient. In the second picture, you can see the additions or modifications that are made with the circuit. We're adding a capnography connection with the capnography line, as well as a 5-inch extension. You'll see why this extension of the circuit helps later in this video. And in this third image, you can now see the semi-open circuit in its final form. It is now ready to use in the dental office setting. Now before we actually get into the room with the parent and patient, we always have an assistant go over the anesthesia with the parents. The assistants will, to the best of their ability, answer the parents' questions, and they will also make sure that the child is NPO. They'll also go over the medical history just to make sure that everything matches their dental records. So we're basically interviewing the parents twice. The assistant interviews them and lets them know what is going to happen. Then we will walk into the room and also confirm our understanding of the patient to take the time and answer their questions. This way we are covering our bases, so to speak. In this clip, Dr. Wall is using a translator to help him conduct the interview. Okay, now what you're seeing here is an intramuscular injection. We should run these cases exactly like we would with an open airway case. So in other words, don't change your dosages just do your regular open airway technique. Now most of you know that the ketamine cocktail takes two to three minutes to really start setting in. For time purposes, we've just skipped that portion of the video. In this clip, Dr. Wall is starting an IV on the patient's right foot. He is going for the greater saphenous vein, which is located anterior and superior to the medial malleolus. Other common IV locations are the cephalic vein in the hand, as seen in this image, the dorsal hand, and the antecubital fossa. Now in this clip, I'm starting the infusion of propofol and remifentanil. These meds are mixed together in the syringe. Typically, I use a mixture of Remy 10. The mixture doesn't matter, though. You can use Remy 5, 7, or 10, whichever you prefer. Now you can see that I'm giving the patient a bolus of Prop Remy 10. The bolus should be around 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilo. So in a 20 kilo child, this would amount to 2 to 3 mLs of propofol and Remy fentanyl. The patient is now apneic and will receive a few breaths of 100% oxygen to build the patient's reserve. The endotracheal tube is gently heated in the water to decrease trauma when the tube is inserted. Sometimes we also rub the tip of the tube and surgery lube just to make sure that the tube moves nicely through the nasal passage. Here Dr. Wall is using the King Vision so that he can visualize the vocal cords. You can see how great the vocal cords visualization is with this device. The majority of time there is a grade 1 view when using a King Vision. Now I have the flow meter hooked up prior to intubating the patients. For the sake of the viewers, we inserted the clip here so that you could see how we are administering oxygen with the Jackson Reese circuit. There are quite a few different ways to administer oxygen. From our experience, the flow meter is probably the easiest delivery method. You can see here the fresh gas flow, which is oxygen, is delivered very close to the nasoendotracheal tube. So rebreathing of carbon dioxide is minimal. We also run our oxygen flow at around two to three liters per minute. Dr. Wall is giving the patient a few breaths of oxygen. You can see the simplicity of this circuit. The APL valve is by Dr. Wall's right hand. He opens it up after he gives the patient a few breaths to minimize the pressure that is built up. We all tape the heads different, so however you want to wrap the head or secure the endotracheal tube is up to you. There's no right or wrong way to do this.
Now you see that Dr. Wall disconnected the anesthesia bag. This helps prevent CO2 buildup. Also, if the patient takes very large breaths, this will not be restricted by the bag. Dr. Wall tapes the circuit to the patient's chest for ease of access. Sometimes the circuit can fall off the patient. By taping it, we are securing its location. The x-rays can be taken before or after the patient is intubated. Sometimes it's preferred to take them after the patient is intubated due to obstruction of breathing, which is caused by the assistance. Now you can see that the dentist is working on the patient's teeth and it's very easy to breathe for the patient without making the doctor stop the procedure. With five to 10 minutes left in the procedure, the infusion pump can be discontinued or it can be tapered down. This way, we can wake the patient up quicker and move on to the next case, therefore increasing our efficiency. Prior to extubation, everything is taken off the patient's face. You can now see Dr. Wall giving the patient a breath of oxygen and then he'll extubate the patient. Before the IV is removed, the patient will be stimulated to test for pain reflex. If the patient is responding nicely, they can be transferred to the recovery room. The IV can also be discharged in the recovery room. Patients are always monitored in the recovery room for vital sign stability. The assistants will go over the marks on the patients and they are there to answer questions for the parents. And this is how you run the Jackson Reese circuit. Thank you for your time and we hope that you enjoyed the video.